All right. Well, all of a sudden there's a momentary silence, so I think that's my cue to get things started. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. And I know we have some people that are still coming. Two of my realtors are. So if they're not here, they're not getting any more business. <laughs> they're going to be here. Uh, and Ray, I want to recognize Denise for putting in a lot of hard work. And what we've done here is kind of set up a network of people who are really generous. Generous that they're willing to share their experience, their skills, and make a difference for other people and improve quality of life and the richness of life for all of us. So we have a lineup of people who have been mostly healthcare providers. Today, we have a mental health care <laughs> for, for those of us who have ever lost sleep, recovery time, stunted our growth because we were worried about paying the overhead or paying the bills or about our future or about how our kids are going to go to college and just what the future holds and do we have a plan. We really have somebody who's going to be able to give us a lot of information that's going to be very useful. Uh, Steve Huntley, I, I linked in. I now asked you to connect with me. Okay. So I did my research. Uh oh. Man, <laughs> for a UCLA fan, he has an amazing amount of interest, of experience, and expertise. He's put in a lot of hard work and accomplished major accomplishments. And what I'd really like to share about Steve is that he's really a good guy. And I know this from just his connection with people who are closest to me and people with whom I work. Uh, he is a relentless advocate. And he has a good heart and he wants the best for all of us. And he has a plan for us. So without further delay, oh I give you Steve Hunt. Thank you. Before you go, Jack, I wanted to show my appreciation to you and to your staff. And, and when I was thinking about it, I said, what, what kind of present can you give to Jack Van Bulow to show your appreciation? So there's only one thing I can do to help your business. It's a two-pound box of candy. Oh. <laughs> I think you can give it to your patient. You just, you've won my, my staff. Right? I know, I know. I figure, what better gift to give a dentist than candy, right? Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Jack. Um, again, thank you very much for letting me come tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little, I'm going to talk about stuff that you should do at the end of the year, and we're going to get into some interesting topics. But I think before I do, I kind of want to set the stage, um, talk a little bit about myself, and um, talk about some terms you're going to hear tonight, and I want to make sure that uh, you understand them. And um, we're going to get into just 10 simple things that anybody can do. These are not complicated. These are not something that is some guy in Wall Street is thinking up. This is stuff that any human being can do. But it, it will help you if you do it by the end of the year. Because the end of the year, in the financial world, that's when things kind of, kind of stop and then they start all over again. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Steve Huntley. I'm a financial planner. I work with Trilogy Financial Services, which is... And what we do as a financial planner is kind of different than most financial people. Most financial people work are out there trying to sell a product or a service or uh, an annuity or life insurance or something like that. What we're trying to do is we would do what's called comprehensive wealth management. In other words, we try to look at the person, the whole person, and we say, what is the person in? What, where, where are they right now? What do they need? to get to their goal in life. So it's not about my goal or, or my sale, it's about what is that person's goal? Is it to put their children through college? Is it to retire? I've had to save money for a quintanera, um, to you know, pass things down. So we really look at that and we really work hard to become what is a lifetime trusted advisor. And what that actually means is, for me, it's I step out of the role of financial planner many times. I'm going to give you a quick example. I got a call last night at 6 o'clock from one of my clients. She said, I picked up the phone. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. My, hus my husband just got summoned. I said, what? Your husband got summoned? This guy's working hard. He's like 30 years with a post office. I said, what do you mean? He got the summons. Well, okay, read it to me. He's got a summons for jury duty. So I said, okay, well, he's going to go to jury duty. He's got to get on the train and go down to Temple Street. So that's what I mean. We, we, we're so trusted by people 
that they will call us and ask us for things like that. So I've been doing this for 20 years. I've worked with lots of different types of people. And it's been an outstanding experience. I want to share some of the stories that I've had, some of the events, to kind of give you a framework. Um, and during that 20 years, I actually live here in Pasadena. I live up the street on Lake and Mountain. If you know where that is, Popeye's Fried Chicken, Tuesday, $1.29 for two pieces. <laughs> Don't make a left turn off a lake, because you're never going to get down to my house, ever. So, and in that, you know, in that time period, um, living here, there's one common thread in this town, and that's on every January 1st that I can remember, they always have a roast break. A million of my closest friends come, and they all, you know, they're going down the Rose Parade down Colorado Boulevard. And I, when I watch the Rose Parade, I look at things a little differently. Um, you ever notice the Rose Queen? She's sitting up there. She's wearing this beautiful white dress. She's a young girl, about 19 years old. And she's always doing what's known as the light bulb wave, right? She's doing this with the elbow up. And I always thought to myself, what is she waving at? You know, what is this woman waving at? And then I thought to myself, ah, oh, from a financial planning standpoint, the only thing she can be waving at is waving goodbye to opportunities she could have had in 2014. <laughs> so I don't want that to happen to you, okay? I want you to be a good rose queen. So let's start talking about the 10 things we're going to talk about tonight. And before I do, I want to just define a couple of words. First of all, I use the word defer a lot. Now, defer to me means we push something off into the future. In the financial world, what it means is you, money today is, is more valuable than money tomorrow. A dollar's a dollar, but still it's worth less in the future. So a lot of the strategies that I'm going to talk about tonight are deferring. You know, my mother taught me that, you know, never put off for tomorrow what you can do today, except when it comes to money. You know, always try to put off to try to defer things, defer taxes. The other thing we're going to talk a little bit about is taxes. Taxes are inevitable. I'll give you the greatest quote I've ever heard about taxes. And I keep this quote in my head at all times. Benjamin Franklin said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. I do not want you to be destroyed at all. So I'm going to give you some ideas on taxes you can do. So let's start with the first one on the sheet there. And that's really simple. Start an estate. What does he mean by that? What is an estate? An estate is everything you have in life. Every shoe, every sock, every car, every, every house is your estate. And in this state, we have um, what is called probate, and I'll get into that in just a second. But look, you might say to yourself, look, I'm 25 years old. I just got a graduate from college. I don't need an estate. I'll tell you what, you do need an estate. You do need to have a trust or a will, because who knows what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I have no idea. But as a financial planner, it's important to protect my clients, and the, one of the major things to do is to start an estate. Now, what does that mean? That means you either have a trust or a will. Okay, I'm, I'm a big fan of trust, and I'll get to that in a second. A will is a great document. It says, I, Steve Huntley, do hereby give everything to my, to my wife. The difference, though, that's really important that you have to keep in mind is a will is a public document. A trust is a private document. So what that means is tomorrow, if I wanted to, in my favorite blue suit, I could walk down to the Hall of Records, pay him 20 bucks, and I can get Michael Jackson's will. I don't believe in that. I believe in confidentiality. I believe in having a trust. Now, people will say, well, what is a trust? What is it? A trust, essentially, and again, I'm not an attorney, but I've worked with these for many, many years. A trust is another human being. It's another human being that doesn't breathe. It, it is actually looked at as a living human being that is controlling your assets. And so what does that mean? Well, when you put together a trust, the most difficult decision is not what's going into it, not who gets the brooch or who gets the diamond ring or who gets the house. That's not important. What is important is who's the trustee? 
Who is going to control your assets when you're not around to control them? It's a very difficult decision. Once that decision is made, everything falls into place. I'll give you an example. I've had a trust, what's called a living trust, for the last uh, 30 years. My brother is my trustee. Took a lot of struggle to get to that level, but he is definitely my, my trustee for my particular trust. So I, I'm a big believer in, in when you have an estate, definitely welcome. Have a trust. The other thing is you can't leave this kind of stuff to chance. There are sometimes people think that, a, that an estate is just going to go from one generation to the next. It, it doesn't work in that way. The last thing that people have a problem with is having a trust is the cost. Okay? You say, oh, that's too expensive. Let me give you the facts on exactly what a trust would cost. All right? Let's say, and this is not uncommon, you have $1 million worth of assets, which in California is not bad. You get a house worth a half a million dollars, cars, all that stuff. Let's save a million dollars. That's your, that's your entire assets that you want to pass to the next generation. On average, in California, a trust costs between 1% to 2% of the assets. All right, so if you have a million dollar assets, it costs about $1,000 for a trust. That's kind of expensive. Well, let's look at the other side of it. If you go to probate, by law, the probate is laid out into you know, $350 per hour for the attorney, $100 for filing fee. There's all these fees. What actually happens is, and is especially right now, is the fact that um, it takes about two years to go through probate. So what actually, on average, about 50% of your estate goes to probate. So 50% of a million dollars is a half a million dollars. So you want to pay a thousand dollars, you want to pay half a million. It's your choice. Okay? Enough about trust. But going with the trust, the second thing I want to talk about is check your beneficiaries. Please, I'm going to get on my knees and beg. This is this is a big issue right now. People have 401ks, have annuities, have um, uh, life insurance, have all that, and things happen, please. This is something that you want to take and you want to give to somebody you love, somebody you care about. But let me give you a little story about what can happen if you don't do your beneficiaries correctly and you don't look at them once a year. About five years ago, I got called by an insurance company, and in the life insurance business, there are things, there's things called an orphan policy. An orphan policy means that the policy is still in place, everything's there, except the, the agent is left. He's retired or died or whatever. I got a call from, a, from an insurance company. They hired me for a small fee to go out and take care of handing a check to a widow. Okay? So I, I got the policy. I got the, the information. I went out. I went to the service. A husband had died. I went to his service. About two weeks later, I got the check. So I got the check in my pocket, I have the policy with me, and I got a call from the attorney that I was to go to the attorney's office. I went to the attorney's office, I sat down, I, the widow needed the money. I had a, by the way, I had a check for $150,000 in my pocket. Okay? You could hear it sizzling, but it was, really, it was really there. So I looked at it, and I looked at her, and it's very, it's, it's, it is practice to always ask for identification. So I said, may I see your driver's license, please? She said, sure. So I saw the driver's license, I looked at the check, I looked at the policy, the check's not made out to her. The check is made out to wife number one, not wife number two. So she said, what, what do you mean? I'm the wife, this goes for my children. I said, no, ma'am, I'm sorry. The check says, and the, and the policy says that, the, that this poor woman is the rightful owner of this money. Oh, what can I do? What can I do? I'm sorry, you can't do anything. I had to go search down the woman, the first wife. She lived in Hemet, by the way. I had to go up there, and I had to deliver the check. My point being is check your beneficiaries. Check your beneficiaries. Do it at the end of the year. Who knows? You may have divorced. You may have... Maybe you don't like the beneficiary anymore. I don't know. Okay, number three is paying college costs early. College is a wonderful experience. But it's not cheap. You know, college goes up twice the rate of inflation. Inflation goes up about 3%. College goes up about 6 right now. But this, this will help you. 
A lot of times, when you have funds set aside to pay for college, you pay for it in the fall, and then you wait till after the first of the year to play the spring, pre, uh, the spring um, amount. If you pay the spring fees before the end of the year, you can take advantage of what's called the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Now, this is $2,500. This is a gift from the United States government. This, this tax credit is not used very much, but it is available to you. What this actually means is they give you a $2,500 tax credit and they'll refund you $1,000, 40%. So not only do you pay the school early, but you also get the ability to get an extra tax benefit. And anytime you can get an extra tax benefit, I'm in the big favor of it. So please, if you can, pay that college cost for the spring before the end of the year. All right, the next one is be generous to charities. I live in Pasadena. You know in Pasadena there's 2,700 registered charities? 2,700 registered charities. It's, it's a great time to be generous with charities to a fault. So listen, if, so if you've got a Maserati sitting on your, on your lawn, you might want to think about donating it to a, a reputable charity. It's a great time to get, to get those things that maybe you want to donate and you don't know how off, off, off your plate. You can donate securities, okay? If you donate just like mutual funds or stocks and bonds, you don't have to pay what is known as capital gains tax, which is 15%. It's all done. So think about being benevolent. But I will give you um, a piece of personal experience. There is a quirk in the law about giving a car. I gave a car away about four years ago. And what happened was that when I went to give the car away, I called up the reputable dealer, I mean the reputable charity, and they said, okay, we'll give you a $500 credit, and then over $500, we need your social security number. So if you feel comfortable with, this, with the charity, you can maximize it out. Okay, there is no ceiling on how much you can give, but just be careful. You know, just be careful nowadays, especially with all the scams there, that you feel comfortable with a reputable charity, okay? And, and give your charities weight. I mean, it's a great time to do it. If you do it right before the end of the holidays, it takes money right off the tax. What you're trying to do, by the way, when you're dealing with your taxes, is trying to keep the idea that it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep, you know? And how much, and also the other thing about taxes that I want to make sure it's not the money that you're earning, it's the money that you present to the government. Say, I am the government, this is how much money I actually have to pay taxes on. If you look on a tax form, it's under line 35, okay, AIG, adjusted, gro I mean AGF, adjusted gross income. It's not how much money you make here, it's how much you present to Uncle Sam. So we want to help Uncle Sam by presenting as less money as possible to him. And charity is a great way. Okay, number five is make the most of your house. Let's talk about the, one of the greatest tax deductions of all time. This thing is a superstar. It's called the mortgage tax credit. The, morg the mortgage would pay that the interest that you pay on a house, that money is tax deductible. And most of it is tax deductible. Actually, they actually call it forced savings because when you buy a house, what happens is the interest, they usually, some reputable mortgage people, will what they call front end the loan. In other words, they put, if you have a 30 year loan, the first five years, you're paying nothing but interest. So you're gonna get that money back. So, but I want you to give you an idea that if you pay twice, if you pay two mortgage payments in December, you get the benefit of that tax credit that you would have gotten in July, and excuse me, in January. But the question is, look, how am I going to pay two house payments in December? All right, I gotta, I gotta buy Christmas presents. I gotta go to Grandma's house. I gotta do. It's very expensive, right? It is. It's a very expensive time of year. Let me give you a strategy for this. This is what I do. Okay, when I pay my mortgage, I take my mortgage amount and I divide it by 12, okay? 
every month I take that little amount that I put in and I put it, I just slide it into the savings. Electron I do it electronically, but I slide it into the savings. Now it's December. Okay? I write the regular mortgage payment and I just double it because I move the money over. It's a very simple, very painless way of saving yourself some more money. So that's if you're if you're if most of your house payment is going for interest, it's a great time to great thing to do. It's a really wonderful technique to do. Also, do the same thing for your property tax. If you'll notice on a property tax, especially in LA County, property taxes are due February like 28th. Okay? And and but if you pay it before December 31st, it is now tax deductible. If you pay it after January 1st, then you gotta wait the whole cycle of 2015 before you can get the benefit of paying it off. So again, not that I don't, you know, not that I don't love taxes, but defer, 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 defer. It's a great strategy to do it. Okay, speaking of defer, let's talk about deferring your income. This is where we're gonna get a little sticky here, sir. There's two types of people in this world. There's 1099 people who work for themselves. There's W-2 people who work for somebody else. Let's take, let's take the example of a person who's a W-2 person. A person who works for somebody else, and let's say that that person works really hard in 2014, and they really got their nose to the grindstone, and now it's December 2014, and they get a bonus. 1% of their salary, 2%, just do a great job. So what happens is if you pay the bonus before December 31st, it now becomes taxable income. You just raised your tax amount for 2014. So what you do is you say, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Boss, for I rely on working hard. Would you please pay me on January 1st? Fairly simple. You're still going to get your bonus. You're still going to get your money, you know, but you're not going to, again, you're showing the government a lower amount of money. Now, let's, yeah. But doesn't that apply to you that have to show up? Pardon me? Doesn't that have to be referring to the bonus for the next year? Yep. It'll be next year. But remember, next the value of the money next year is worth less than it is today. You're paying, so you're paying the government back with money that's not as valuable, as, and you got a whole year to do it, so. Now, if you're a 1099 or you're an independent person, how do you how do you handle the strategy? Okay, how do you how do you take advantage of this? A lot of times, people will get invoice or be invoicing during December. Things are busy. Their 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 plumbing business is really busy. Especially, I'm going to use a plumber this time of year. Plumbers are really busy this time of year. Grandma comes in, the toilet backs up. You know, the it does. It does. I mean, I hear this all the time, right? So. Plumbers go out, they do the work, they send an invoice, they send a bill, okay? They get paid before December 31st. That becomes taxable income. So what they should do is collect all the invoices, hold on to them until January the 1st. On January the 1st, they send it out. They're still going to get their money, they're still, but they again, they've lowered what they are presenting to the government, okay? It's just a simple, simple thing. It's not hard to do this. So that, that's deferring your income. All right. Let's go back to the person who is a W-2, who's getting paid by somebody else. And that person, a lot of times I've heard that people get this horrific tax bill in April. And they're working real hard, and they say, well, how come my taxes are so bad in April? How come I always have to pay the government? The main reason is because you have not looked at your withholding. December is a wonderful time of year to take a look. Do you, you know, you kind of know how much you're going to have to pay. You kind of know how things are. You can adjust your withholding accordingly. Bless you. So that, you know, you're not, you're not paying this big tax bill in April. You're still going to maybe have to pay, but maybe not as much. So this is a good time of year. Sit down with your employer or the, the people who handle the payroll and say, what are my deductions? Is it too many? Is it too less? Make those arrangements. Okay. Um, number eight is reallocate, reallocate your investments. This is a, this is a great one. Um, the stock market's been going up. It really has. It went up a lot. I think it's went up 12, 12% over the year, okay? 
when you're working on your portfolio, everybody invests for something. I've never met anybody who didn't invest for a reason. Even people who are gambling in the, on a day trading or gambling to, to make money in the, in the stock market, okay? So you have a strategy. So maybe over the years, your strategy became too much, too skewed. Let's say you have mutual funds and, you, and they made a lot of money in the tech business, but they didn't make much money in the car side of it. So it's a great time of the year to adjust your portfolio. Sometimes the, the idea is to try to balance it. In other words, you try to say, okay, this is all my gains. I'm going to sell those, all right? You sell them, you're going to pay what is known as um, a short-term tax, capital gains tax, which is 15%, but maybe you can offset that with some losses so you can balance. <clears throat> the idea is to keep your portfolio going in the direction you want it to go. If you don't look at your portfolio, it will come back to bite you. It really will. You'll get, you'll get to be 20 years down the road, and you'll say, how come, I'm, how come I'm losing money? This is what happened to all the people in 2008. They never looked at their portfolio. So the, the world is just making money hand over fist in 2008, and suddenly the bottom came out. Literally, the bottom came out. So all those people who never looked at their portfolio in 2008 are now recovering. They're still recovering. They're trying to get back to where they were in 2008, 2007. So please. It's a great time to sit with your professional and reallocate your investments. Make sure you're on track to get the goal that you want, whatever the goal happens to be. All right, number nine, and one of the great goals in, is to add to your 401k. You know what a 401k is? You know what a 453 is, a 457, and all that stuff? This is, this is what that really is, and it's true, is the is the law that gives you a defined benefit plan. Now, what is a defined benefit plan? The only one that I know of right now, there's only two that I know of that are really big right now. One is the US military. If you're in the military, you spend 20 years, you're gonna get, they're gonna give you money for the rest of your life. The other one's the post office. You work for the post office, they're gonna, they're gonna think. Defined benefit plans used to be the vogue. The, the statistics are in 1950, 65% of all companies offered one. Today, the statistics are at 8%. So what my point is, the 401k is on you. The, the onus is on you. It's your retirement. They gave you the vehicle to do it, but they're making you do it yourself, okay? Whether you, whether you work with a professional like myself or you just kind of throw darts at the thing, it's, 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 Incredible. So add to your 401k, all right? Now, how much can you add? Most, you, if you're under 50, you can add $17,500. If you're over 50, you can tack in another $5,000. That's $22,500. Well, that's a lot of money, Steve. How can I do that? Think about it like this. Whatever you're going to add to your 401k is going to reduce the amount you're going to present to the government, all right? You're still your money. You still earned it and we're deferring it to your future. Someday you might want to retire. You might want to live in Costa Rica. You might, you know, you might want to travel the world, go into Queen Mary. So, pardon me? That's right, you're paying yourself to save your own money, but you're controlling it. You and your financial person are controlling this money. So, Back to say, so please, look at your 401k. If you don't have a 401k, start one. They're painless. It takes about 10 minutes of paperwork. You can put the money in. You can take it, have it taken out electronically, you know, but it continues to grow. But, but it's a great, great tool that you can use, again, for tax deferment because you're not paying the money on the taxes. You will pay money. On a 401k, you will pay it at the end. And this is what you pay. You don't pay on the premium. You don't pay what you put in. You pay on what it earned. Okay, so if you do really well, no, no, it's not bad. But think about it like this. If you, if you put in half a million dollars, right, and you got $600,000, that means you only earned 100000 and you pay 15% tax, that's, you owe the government 15%. Think about deferring. It's a wonderful experience. But, you know, a 401k is that, uh, 
There's some other vehicles. There's what's called a Roth. A Roth is you've already earned the money and you pay taxes on it, put the money in there, and now you take the money out tax free. Okay? It has a little different amount you can put in it. You put $5,500 up to the age of 50. Anything over the age, if you're over the age of 50, they let you put in another $1,000. So please, if you don't have one, it's a great vehicle. Anybody can do it. It's very simple and it's to be managed. It allows you to control your future, your financial future, especially when it comes to retirement. Okay, last but not least is, is number 10. See where you're saving a month. Um, after doing this for 20 years, I've come to the realization that everybody has a magic number. The magic number can be, I need $2 million in order to retire at 65 and not run out of money. Or it could be $100,000 for my child's Quintanier, or it's going to be two hundred fifty thousand to go to the University of Southern California for fifteen minutes. I, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. That's a magic number. So the question is: at the end of the year, where are you in compared to your magic number? And again, the magic number is yours. It's not your financial planner. It's not my job to tell you. Oh, you need to have. You need to. Put the money away from hiring. People maybe want to buy a house. People want to buy, you know, or start an own business or whatever. But what is the magic number? Are you on track for that? If you're not, maybe you need to twist some things around. Maybe you need to, to make some adjustments, tweak some things, defer some things. You know, maybe, maybe um, you do a different vehicle. You know, maybe instead of putting your money into a, a mutual fund, you maybe put it into a variable annuity or something of that. Something a little bit more aggressive, less aggressive. But it's that time of the year when you're going to look at your magic number, you know, and maybe you have multiple magic numbers. I know people who have retirement, want to put their kids through college, you know, want to save for the, uh, the I had a lady the other day, I want to save $75,000 for a wedding. Fine. That's great. At least we know, right? I'd hate to be surprised with it, with it you know, like $75,000 for a wedding. So anyway, make sure you're on track. Make sure you're, you're on your goal towards that, okay? All right, so that's the 10 thing. So let's go back. I'm going to end this up with, my, with the Rose Queen. Okay, you ever watch the Rose Queen now? She's right going down the road, right? She's got, she's got doing her elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist. Now she's smiling. You know why she's smiling? Because she did 10 things that I told her to do before the end of the year. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>